Leinigan, you're insane. They're not creatures you can fight. They're an elemental, an act of God. Ten miles long and two miles wide. Ants. Nothing but ants. And every single one of them a fiend from hell. Now, those words come from a short story by German author Carol Stevenson. And the story's titled, Leinigan versus the Ants. And the person here talking is the district commissioner, somewhere in the deepest, darkest parts of the Brazilian rainforest. And he's talking to Leinigan himself. And the sentiment's quite clear in his words. Leinigan is a coffee plantation owner. It's a pretty large plantation. It has around 400 indigenous workers there. And the problem for Leinigan and his men is that the plantation is situated right in the middle of an approaching mass of army ants. And the district commissioner is saying to him, if you stay in the face of these approaching voracious army ants, who are said to be able to devour a buffalo in little more than the time it takes to spit three times, then you and your men will be eaten alive. Now, a bit like developers, Leinigan's quite a stubborn chap, and he chooses to stay behind and face the ants with his men anyway. But it's not without personal injury, and tragically the loss of some of his men. But nonetheless, it is a story of triumph over adversity. Now, for us in the closure world, the name Leinigan has a very special meaning for us because it's our build tool of choice. And in fact, if you look on the README page in GitHub for Leinigan, you'll find the quote that I opened with at the very top of the README. <clears throat> now, I think Leinigan is a fantastic name for such a build tool. It's a tool that has a great focus on automation. It makes things really simple. And if you're anything like me, you'll have spent a lot of your career wrestling and wrangling with build tools. So to name a build tool after triumph over adversity, to me, is a fantastic idea. But there's another reason why I like Leinigan as a name for a build tool. Because if you imagine the title, Leinigan versus the Ants, it's only a short step to imagine that could be Apache Ant, the pure Java build tool, it's then only a very short step on to say closure versus Java. And then we can go one step further and say functional versus object-oriented programming. So perhaps that name quite cleverly encapsulates some of the sentiment that may have brought some of you today to the JVM tracks. So why are people moving towards and looking at other JVM languages such as closure? Well, there's a few theories about what that could be. Some people would say that between Java 1.5 and 1.8, there's not been an awful lot happening. So perhaps the rise of some of the JVM languages is about addressing opportunities for innovation uh, within the Java community. I really like this quote. Java, along with many other object-oriented languages, I would refer to as a high ceremony language. You don't really get things very easily or for free. You do have to set up context, you have to set up environment. And it's not just a technical issue, because for many people such as graduates or, or people new to programming, sometimes if people like ourselves are used to handling Java on a day-in, day-out basis, forget the steep learning curve that comes along with object-oriented paradigms. This, for me, is one of the key reasons to look at functional languages on the JVM. And how, how I like to interpret this is the professor encapsulates some knowledge, and the consumer of that knowledge, the student, is confused whenever that changes. And that, to me, is about one key thing, mutable state. How many times have we spent chasing down bugs in our applications 
that sometimes happen, sometimes don't happen, depending on timing, depending on environment. A lot of these issues tend to be related to state. But we've worked with state for a number of years. Is that really a good enough reason to up sticks and look at other languages? Possibly not. But this might point to one. Moore's law is something we've relied on for a number of years to understand how we're going to improve in terms of computational performance. Essentially, the number of transistors on a chip doubles approximately every two years. And what that means for us as developers is when your project owner says the application isn't going fast enough, all we need to do is hang around for a couple of years and then we'll improve the performance. <clears throat> And one way, what this, this diagram, I think, really well encapsulates what happens with Moore's Law. There's two things you can extract from this. First of all, there's a pace of, of the increase. So, round about 1970, if, if you considered transistors to be people, you were looking around 2,300 would be packed into a single chip. That's approximately the size of a small music hall. In just over 40 years, we've got to the position of 1.3 billion it's a massive, massive increase. So it gives you an idea of how quickly this has progressed. But the other thing that I think is important about this diagram is scale. Because if you take those 1.3 billion people and you cram them in to that original music hall, then that gives you the idea of how tightly we're packing transistors into chips these days. But there's a problem with that. Because physics won't allow us to go a considerable, about, a considerable amount further. We can't cram many more transistors in there. So where do we go? We can't hang around for two years and wait on, on the density increasing again for our products to get more performant. So we need to start looking at other options. And one very good option of doing this is, although we can't increase density, we can put more chips on our machines. And that means we need to get better at parallel programming. We need to get better at writing our applications so that can, they can take advantage of the cores that are available to them. Now, some of you will be thinking, well, I could easily do that in Java. I'm very familiar with all the locking patterns that I need, and you, I have no problem with that. But does everybody in your team have that same capability? Do the graduates in your team have that same capability? And that, for me, is one of the fundamental focuses of something like Clojure, a functional language especially when it can run on the JVM, so we're saying it can go onto the infrastructure that companies already have, is we've got immutability that makes parallel programming across cores very, very simple. Now, I first came across Clojure when I was working at a company who focused on building research systems predominantly for the, the management of chronic disease. Now, this was a very innovative company. And they used to make a lot of time available to us for us to pursue different types of innovation within, within business time that didn't, didn't align with what we were necessarily doing as part of our core work. And I used to take this opportunity any time I could. And one evening I was sitting at home thinking, how, how can I use the time that's available? And my mind was taken back to a paper I read a few years previous. I'm, I'm a big believer that developers should read papers because what we do on a day-to-day -day basis really doesn't push the boundaries of what's theoretically possible. And the only way you can know what's possible is by reading papers. And I was thinking back to one of the papers that I read, which was titled, Twitter Mood Predicts Stock Market. Now, I can assure you, for a developer one night, holding a beer and a paper in that hand, reading that title, that really got me quite excited. But once I got over my personal greed, I started thinking, how could I really apply this to the management of chronic disease? And as it turns out, it's actually a very well-researched area. And in particular, one paper stood out for me. And that was about tracking the spread of contagious disease using social media. So I went back to the business and proposed that we, we do this as an additional project. And they took it on because they could see the relation to chronic disease and we, we got some time available to us. So myself and some data scientists and a couple of clinicians set out to see if we could replicate the research in the paper. Now, I saw this going, I saw two parts to this problem. 
I saw the data science part, which I believe would be the tricky part, the really difficult part. And then I saw the scalability issue. And I thought, that, that's fine. I, I deal with that day in, day out. I can scale this. I said, this isn't a problem. I'm absolutely fine. And I got a bit of a surprise. So quite quickly, we found the data scientists got command line R up on the keyboard, uh, up on the screen. And they started hacking away at the data. And we watched in awe as they did their work, their magic. And we found quite quickly that they were able to start to score tweets with respect to whether or not it was likely to show some form of flu, a contagious disease. And in fact, this is a tweet that I sent at the time that we collected through the Twitter stream. Um, there were quite a few strange text, uh, tweets kicking about at the time. And I'm sure you won't be surprised to find out that this scores quite high for potential flu symptoms. And on a side note, if anybody knows who Catalina Rubottom is, please apologise to her. I don't know what I've done to offend her, but she did favourite me feeling like this that day. <laughs> So we, we, we got the, the tweets being scored, and we decided now it was time to move on to the scalability. And we started throwing technologies at the problem. We, we had a, a huge range of technologies available to us. We had Hadoop clusters, we had Postgres, we had Mongo, we had loads of different things. But it didn't matter. When we took that data in and we, we put it somewhere, it didn't matter what we did. We couldn't scale the analysis of the tweets retrospectively. So we could get things to go fairly quickly, perhaps, when we were looking for flu. But then when we changed it to see could we identify people with diabetes or perhaps showing those types of signs and complaining about them in social media, we couldn't get the same response. And I left that company round about that time. I, I never got the solution at that time to, to the problem of scaling social media analysis. And I joined ThoughtWorks. And I was told quite quickly that I was going to be joining a closure project. So I started thinking, can I go back to that problem of scaling social media analysis as a mechanism for me to practice my closure skills? And one evening, I, I read a quote by Mario, Mario Morales, who is vice president of semiconductor research at IDC. And he said, data is the new currency. Data is the new currency. But he went on after that to say that the, the really intelligent companies, the clever companies, are working on how to extract the value from that data. And that started me thinking things through slightly differently. Because in a typical value chain transformation, closest to the y-axis, you've got what I believed at the time was raw data. And that's not particularly valuable. We think of data as valuable, but it's not particularly valuable. It actually costs us money to store it and protect it. But as you progress through the value chain transformation, it gains and gains in value. So once it's, once it's analytically prepared, it gains a little bit more value. Then after analysis and after insight, and then the, the utopias, prescriptions and predictions about what you can do, that's when data becomes really valuable. But then, doing some further reading, I realised, or I read, that raw data is an oxymoron. There is no such thing as raw data. Any data, whether you see, you hear, you taste, anything at all, by inclusion or exclusion from a data set, that data is already filtered. It's already processed in some way. We, we never see or, or touch or hear raw data. And that got me thinking, how can we think about this problem differently? If this data is already filtered, can we actually bypass that stage of storing the tweets that was really costly when we were working with this before, and actually move on to, to storing and working purely with the analytically prepared data? So essentially, don't store the raw data. It's not raw data. Just do a little bit more processing at that stage and store the analytically prepared data. So with, with that bit of insight, I thought, how, how can I go about storing this now? And another quote that's quite famous these days is that in memory is the new on disk, and on disk is the new on tape. And I thought, really, if we want this to be fast and we want to be able to do live calculations on our data, we really want this to be in memory. 
And after exploring a bit further, I realised the technology we need for this already exists. Redis is a key value store, one of the, the NoSQL databases. And it, it does exactly what it says in the tin. It stores keys and values. But one of the things with Redis that people don't tend to know quite so much about is that it's got fantastic support for bitmaps. And in that case, what happens is you still have your key for the data you want to collect, and then you still have your value. Your value is a string. Almost everything in Redis is a string. But essentially, in this case, your string becomes an array of bits that are either one or zero, depending on what you want to count. And once you get into that position of manipulating your data, modeling your data in such a way that you can purely do bit counts on it, then it becomes extremely fast. Now, it will be easier to start to demonstrate this through code. So I think that's probably the best way to go. Can I, can I see by show of hands, how many people here have worked with Clojure before? OK, mixed response, about, probably about a third. So what we'll do for the people who have never seen Clojure before, we'll do a very quick tutorial. So imagine this to be a method in Java, albeit a very pointless one. I don't know why you would write this, but... Do you see what happened there? It's subtle. We'll do it again. One more time. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now fully qualified. Close your developers. <laughs> Joking aside, people worry about parentheses with, with lists and closure. And really, there aren't any more parentheses, really. It's just a different structure. And I, I was talking in, in Hamburg fairly recently, and someone in the audience said that he'd read that closure just wants to, everything just wants to get a cuddle. And I think that's quite nice. You just move the bracket out and give everything a cuddle. It's quite straightforward. There are, joking aside, there are one or two other things we'll need to look at, but I think it's probably best to explore that as we progress through the code. So we're back to Redis. How can we store data in Redis in such a way that we can really analyse it quickly, make it really readily available for us? Some closure. So what you see here, this is a, a very simple piece of code. At the top, you've got a require, which would be analogous to your import or your using or whichever language you're, you're working with. And then we have a couple of functions. So within that create tweet ID, everything we're going to have to do here, we're going to need an identifier for the tweet. And for a number of reasons, I don't want to associate or bind myself with the IDs that come along with, with the tweets and so on. This is purely an internal thing. So what you see here is that, that dub car, that says with Carmine. Carmine is a Clojure library for interacting with Redis, and it's a fantastic library. If, if you use Clojure, please do uh, take a look at it in GitHub. But that just says with Carmine. So anything within there is going to be executed essentially with a connection to the database. You can think of it as a connection string. And all we're doing is we're calling inker with that string. And inker is a simple increment. It's an atomic increment of something within Redis. So that's given us a unique identifier for the, the tweet that's coming into the system. So what we do, let here you can think of um, as, as scoping, the, the initialization of a, a variable, if you like. There's no such concept of assignment in functional languages. So that tweet ID is going to be scoped for until the ending bracket of the let. So we're going to capture the result of calling create tweet ID in that identifier. And then we're going to go ahead and set bits. So again, this is happening with Carmine in the Carmine um, context. So it is going to go out to the database. And what you can see here, how you would read this, is you would say, find the value associated with the key created at so we've said already that Redis is all about key value pairs. So there will be a, a key in Redis somewhere with a, a, a value the same as that created that value. And then we're going to find the bit of index tweet ID. So that identifier becomes almost an index in that array of bits that's been held in the value. And then we're going to set that to one. Very simple. Until that point, it would have been set to zero. Now it's set to one. 
How would we get that information back out? Well, it's quite simple. Again, with the Carmine connection, we can do bit counts. So in this case, we're counting all the bits associated with the key Scotland, where I come from, or joviality, or a random string of any other kind. Let's look at that in a slightly different way. So let's imagine that the table you're seeing here, on the, your left-hand side, you have the keys that you would see in Redis. And on your right-hand side, you have the values that will be associated. So if a tweet came in, the very first tweet ever, we'll call that zero. And we've identified in some way that it's come from England. Then we would set the bit against the England key, the ENG key, at tweet ID zero, and we would increment that to one. Very simple. Let's take a look at the next tweet that comes in. So we've gone from zero to one. We've incremented the identifier. This time, for some reason, we know it's come from Scotland. So we're going to set against the Scotland key in position one. We're going to set that to one. Another one comes in for England. And we gradually build these up and up and up. And then you can see it becomes quite easy after that to sum up all of the bits that we want to count. And we all know this is incredibly fast when you do these types of operations on computers. They're really good at counting ones. Okay, let's take one more example. So that same original tweet, tweet zero, has come in again. And we've identified not only was it from England, but it also represents some form of joviality. So position zero, we're going to set that to one against the jovial key. Going to see some hostility in position two, uh, in position one, and then some shyness in two, and it continues on in the exact same format. So you can build up, you can see you can build up lots of keys. A single tweet could be associated with a country, it could be associated with a sentiment, it could be associated with anything that you want to count, and you just increment the position within the value. So let's see how that would apply once we start doing slightly more complex things. Because Redis doesn't only do simple things like bit counts. It can do ands, ors, xors, nots. It's, it's really very powerful. So what the code here is doing is it's saying, we're going to do the bit op and. And we're going to stick the result of that in a temporary key called England and joviality. And the things that we want to do the and operation on are England and joviality. So it's going to take the England value, the joviality value, it's going to and them and get the result and put it in a temporary location. A bit of hygiene, we don't want to grow out of control with all of our keys. So we will create a temporary, a temporary variable and we're going to expire it after 10 seconds. And then we'll go ahead and count it. So again, let's take a, a bit of a visual look at this. So that was the data we got from our England key. That's the data we get from our jovial key. We perform the AND. And it's very simple to count the results. Now remember, this is all happening in memory. It's incredibly fast. We'll do one more, slightly more complex example. How many people in Scotland are tired and grumpy after the referendum? So I don't know if you know, in, in Scotland, we recently voted as to whether or not we should remain part of the UK or become an independent country. And it was, it was very close, but I think a lot of people work very hard. And if we're not known for being grumpy already, we're probably all quite tired and exhausted after the process. So how many people in Scotland are tired and grumpy after the referendum? So here, we're going to look at the keys, for example, fatigue, or hostility. We're going to OR them because we want to count anything that could be either one of those. We're going to AND that temporary key with Scotland. And then we're going to go ahead and do our bit count. So again, to take a visual look at that, here's our hostile key, our fatigue key. We'll go ahead and OR them. And then we're going to feed the result of that into the second part of the process and, and use the, the Scotland key and value with it. And there's our value. So given that there were only four tweets sent from Scotland, 
about 50% of us are tired and grumpy. I don't know if that's living up to expectations or a result of anything. So, so it's very simple. It's not any more complicated than that, but it is very fast and very powerful. So what would this mean for an architecture to do the type of social media analysis that we're talking about? So at a very high level, this is the kind of architecture we're looking at. First of all, we need to get the, the data from somewhere. And you'll notice any time there are key libraries that I'm using, I'll, I'll mark them uh, with the Octocat up in the top corner. So first of all, we need to get data in from the Twitter sphere. And there are a few ways that you can obtain Twitter data. Um, the one that we're using here is using their streaming API. So you essentially hook up, and then you get loads and loads of data flowing towards you. Now, at this point, we're already doing some filtering. I had said previously that there's no such thing as raw data, and this is no exception uh, to that rule. So at this point, before we even get the data in, we're already saying we want to create a bounding box over Europe and filter out all the rest of the world from that. But with Twitter, you can only give it a bounding box. You can't be more accurate than that. So any further filtering to check if it's from the UK or not would have to be done at application level. We're also going to filter for tweets that are geotagged, because it's not much use to us if we can't identify a general area. Otherwise, we don't know where the sentiments come from. And the further filtering, of course, is going to be dependent there as well. And then, of course, we want to check for English language. This would be equally applicable to other languages. However, uh, OpenNLP had specific support for the types of things it was doing uh, in English, so we did that filtering. Now, an important thing to note is any time you have streaming data coming in, it's important to buffer that data because there are undoubtedly going to be times where you can't keep up with the data and other times where you're running ahead of the data. So you have to buffer it out somewhere so that you can take advantage of the, of the troughs in order to catch up with the peaks. Um, when I started out, we were using uh, LMAX Disruptor. Um, things have kind of changed from then, um, but ultimately we are using ClosureWorks Meltdown Library um, in order to wrap up different dispatchers under the hood. We're doing some journaling so that we record key things that we might want at that time, potentially replay them, and we do some syncing for redundancy as well. But I don't want to talk too much more on, on that process because really the guts of what we want to do is the analytics of the tweets. So first of all, we want to look at what? What sentiment is being dis displayed by the tweets that are coming in? And sentiment is a strange thing because it, it's not always clean cut. There's perhaps a sentiment that somebody's trying to express, but equally there could be a sentiment that somebody has interpreted, and they could be completely different. And one of the important things to, to note about what we're doing today is it's not about getting accurate on absolutely everything. It's about identifying trends over the course of millions upon millions of tweets. So back in 1988, uh, Watson et al. were doing some research into things called positive effect and negative effect. The positive effect is how enthusiastic and excited and up for things, how, how full of life you are at that time. Negative effect isn't actually the opposite. It sounds like it would be the opposite, but this is actually more about subjective stress. You could be very positive, uh, you're very positive and up and full of life, but you could still be scoring quite high for negative effect. So they did emerge as, as quite distinctive and orthogonal dimensions. But ultimately, th this measure um, called PANAS, Positive and Negative Effect Schedule, um, gives tools that enable us really to start to determine the state of somebody's mind at that point. And the way that they did this, I, I find it was incredibly simple, but it's also incredibly effective because it's used across industries, it's used in research, and has been used since 88 very effectively but they had a very simple questionnaire, a 20-point questionnaire. And all they asked people to do who were sitting in the questionnaire was to simply mark on a score of one to five how much or little they felt that word either that day or depending on what they're doing, possibly over the last week. So it's very straightforward. You bring all these together and then off the back of that, you're able to rearrange those and sum them to get a score for positive and negative effect. And that becomes very powerful. 
But then just a few years later, the, the same authors went ahead and came up with Panis X, Panis Extended. And what you see here in this case is we still have the original negative effect and positive effect. However, we now have 11 other mood states. And that becomes very handy for us because you can start to think of those mood states, those words, as being the keys that we would want to count in Redis. So, fairly recently, Panis T came about, which is essentially Panis X. It's a, the 60-point questionnaire. It comes up with the 11 mood states and the positive and negative effect scores. And it augments it for online social networks. Now, it does a few things here. It accounts for bias. Uh, I know when I'm happy, I'll tweet, and when I'm annoyed, I'll tweet. But certain other things in between, I won't necessarily express very widely. It outlines some guides for sanitization. And also, quite interestingly, is validated against real events in the world. So that paper, when it came out, had 10 different real events. And they, you were able to track them quite accurately over the course of the time and, and, and with the corresponding scores um, for sentiment. So, sanitization. How are we going to do this? We're, we're essentially going to have to do a dictionary comparison. This is a, a lexical approach. You could very easily have taken a machine learning approach to this. Um, however, then we have to have a massive training data set. We have to do all sorts of complications there. And like I said, this was really just getting up and running with some closure to get some practice. So I thought I'll take the lexical approach. So what you need to do is, first of all, try and get rid of some of the noise. We know there's a lot of noise out there in Twitter. So, for example, media and advertising is probably going to come in the form of URLs. We can probably cut them out. It's quite interesting, though, because I know I'll commonly tweet URLs when I'm happy about something or excited. It's a bit of a shame to lose some of that information. But again, we're back to the position of we're looking at the trends in the data. We're not worried about the individual data. This is about doing en masse. We also need to account for things like text speak. So, LMAO in the corner there, laugh out loud and all these types of things. We need to accommodate them and convert them into a language that's going to be suitable, some kind of English language. We need to account for smileys and emojis as well, which again is transferring them into some kind of word-based uh, representation. But then once we're in that position, we will have something probably considerably longer than 140 characters. However, it starts to represent a language that we, we can work with. And you'll notice in the top corner there, um, there's a, a nice closure wrapper uh, for OpenNLP, which provides a lot of support for the types of things we're doing here. Uh, but you then, once we have that language, we're in the position of doing things like word stemming or potentially limitization. And what that is, is taking the words and cutting them back to something that is commonly, identif commonly identifiable. So run, runner, running, ran, all these things would want to be one thing that we can compare against our dictionary lookup. And the dictionary lookup is done against the 60 original questions that you would have got in Panis X or Panis T. Once we've, got to, once we've got to that stage, before we do our dictionary lookup, we need to do some part of speech tagging. Because just because I say I'm excited, I might have actually said I'm not feeling very very, very excited today, in which case there's a negation quite far away in the sentence. But that part of speech tagging gives us the tools and the information that we need in order to figure out whether it's actually negated or if it's actually true. Now, at that point, I'm not going to dive into any code on this particular area, but at that point, what we do get out is a pile of keys that we can use in Redis. Those are the, the keys that we associate our value with that will gradually increment ones depending on the, the tweet that's come in. So the next stage is where. Where was the sentiment sent from? Where was the tweet sent from? Now, I, I got a wee bit creative uh, with this process. It was a, it, it was a home project, so I, could, I didn't have to justify what I was doing to anyone. Um, so this is what you get in, in your tweet. You get a longitude and a latitude. Now, there are some challenges when you're doing something that needs to process high volume when it comes to reverse geocoding. Reverse geocoding is a process of taking longitude and latitude and converting it into some kind of human readable form. Now, first of all, 
We don't want external services because that, that, that brings about network coverage that we, we really can't reason about. So we want to avoid that at all costs. We want to avoid any kind of heavy I.O. We don't want to be reading from disk. And that, that equally applies to going round trips to database. Again, we're in a position where accuracy isn't too much of a concern. If we're looking at the body of a country and you're out by a few metres here or there, that probably isn't such a big, such a big deal. Now, it took me back to an approach that I took um, some time ago when I was doing some work in clinical imaging. What you're looking at here is a CT thorax, essentially a cross-section through the human body. So you can see two lungs essentially at that point. Now, what you can do is if you plot the distribution of grayscale voxels, voxel is a, a kind of volumetric pixel. If you plot them in a histogram, you can see quite clearly the split between dark and light. And if we were to draw a line down the middle and use that as a conversion into either pure white or pure black, you know, no grayscale in between, then you get a binary image where you can fill in the holes in the lung area. And quite quickly, with an atlas-based approach, you can identify the right and the left lungs. And I thought, well, that's quite interesting. If I could do that with an atlas for, for identifying where the tweets came from, then that could potentially be quite powerful and quite quick. So off I went. I coloured in a map, got the crayons out. I was quite excited. But there's a bit of a problem with this as an approach. Around 2,000 years ago, Eratosthenes, very cleverly, a fantastic feat of thought, figured out that the world isn't, in fact, flat. You're not going to fall off the end if you keep going and going. And as fantastic a feat as that was, it was exceedingly awkward for my code. Now, fortunately, there are a number of ways where you can take a globe and split it out into a flat map, a flat representation. This one that you see here, where we pull apart from the north and the south poles, is called equi-rectangular projection. And once we get into that position, it becomes quite easy to cut down one side and flatten that map out. And now we get into the position of having an X and a Y coordinate. Now, some of you are possibly realising that things look a little bit skewed the further from the middle that you go. And you'd be absolutely right. But fortunately for me, there's a really handy little equation that I can use to figure out the, the exchange between, uh, between those axes. So what would that mean? How would I work with that? So we'd have that original map. We'd have an X and a Y axis. And then whenever the longitude and the latitude come in, I would be able to go across X positions, go up Y positions, check the color under the, under the, the picker at that location, and figure out where we are. And again, that could potentially be very, very fast. But there's a lot of moving parts. And to be honest, I didn't particularly want to be hand coding all this stuff and, and thinking about canvases and so on. And then I stumbled across uh, a couple of people online who were talking about reverse, reverse raster approaches to this uh, very issue. And in fact, you might recognize Mike's name, Mike Bostock, because he's a chap behind D3. Now, D3 has some fantastic support for these types of geo operations as well as for drawing out images and checking colours and all those kinds of things, it becomes very, very easy. The obvious problem, we're on the server. But it wouldn't be a Java conference if we didn't find some way of getting Java in there. So Java FX. In particular, the new NASORN JavaScript engine makes this very achievable server side. So let's get a look at some of the code. So again, we've got a requires at the top. Hiccup um, that you see there, that's quite interesting. It's just a, it's a closure representation of HTML, if you like. Um, you'll see some of that in the, the build page where I'm, I'm dynamically building up the HTML. Um, we've got some scripts. Those scripts essentially contain some helper functions and the, the D3 libraries and so on, some GeoJSON. Uh, and then essentially I create a browser side, uh, uh, sorry, I create a browser server side pass in the HTML that I'm constructing, and, and load up a server-side browser in memory. That's the HTML that we're dynamically building up with the scripts. 
And then after that, any time we want to use it, it becomes really easy to construct the browser and to execute against it. Now, you might be wondering, do you really have to do that for absolutely every query that you do? And the answer is no. For the, for the closure enthusiasts or, uh, among us, I'm using uh, Stuart Sierra's component library under the hood, so I can construct this up front. It's got a nice life cycle. And then once this is all in place, it's simply a, a JavaScript call each time to the existing stuff. So then we need to think about when. Because that time component is very valuable to us if we want to group together sentiments and locations. So this is the kind of thing that you get in from a tweet. But the problem is, if we take that key-based approach, we're going to have an awful lot of keys in Redis. 31 million seconds in a year. If we group by seconds, then those functions that we're dynamically building up are, are going to be quite horrific. So again, I got a little bit creative with this. So if, if you think about a, a typical clock, I really don't want to consider anything as granular as seconds. In fact, that, that in itself would bring around a number of problems with, with privacy and different concerns like that. So I, I don't want it to be as granular as that. What I do want to do is consider minutes. So all tweets that come in within a, a, a minute period, I want to gather them together within a single key. Similarly, all the ones that come in within an hour period, I would do the same. And that would scale up for days, for months, and for years as well. Interestingly, notice that I've prefixed those representation of dates with a YY or an MM and so on. That's quite important um, because the zeros at the end would also represent a valid uh, time of another kind. And I did spend quite a while at one point wondering where all my data had gone. So how do we do that in Clojure? What does it look like? Well, it's quite straightforward. We have an input formatter which matches the, the format that's coming in, and we have a range of output formats. We then want to construct a date object, and then we're going to map over all the formats that we want to, want to obtain in order to create keys. And at that point, we're back in familiar territory, because we're back with a Redis data model at that point. We have a total of 11 keys. We have sentiment, jovial, sadness, and so on. We have a location, so a country key, something like England, Scotland. And then we have a range of different date keys. And the combinations of all of these things together gives us everything that we need to start to perform some really powerful analysis. So how do we tie all that together? So that data to analytics function takes in our, our data keys, the keys that we want to mark things against. Again, we're back at that beginning stage where we're creating the unique identifier for the tweet. And then essentially we're going to iterate over all of those keys and do that set bit function that we looked at earlier on and set the, ident set the, the bit to one against the associated tweet ID. Very straightforward. There's another aspect to this. This, is, this gets the data in and it allows us, as we saw earlier with, with figuring out, is, is someone from England happy and is someone from Scotland grumpy and tired? We, we've got everything we need at this point in order to, to pull together all of our analytics. But how do we extract that stuff? How do we get it back out? And what, one library that I, I really like in Clojure is Composure. Essentially, it's a routing engine that allows you to, to uh, point back different routes, different URIs back into Ring, which is, is our server. And I took the, the Mongo database approach of building up JSON queries. So what you, you see here is a query type. So for example, we want to count something or you know, that they could become as complex as we like. The params that we want to pass into that, so fatigue or hostility and perhaps the locations. You really, you could evolve this JSON in any way that you liked. But what we then want to do is we want to pass that as a query string. So we do some validation of the data as it comes in, the query as it comes in. But once we've done that, then Clojure actually has some fantastic polymorphic support. Uh, one, one example of that is def multi. So here what we're saying is, 
We're going to define a function called execute, but that query type keyword and enclosure keywords are functions. So that's going to essentially look at the map that comes in and, it, and point to dispatch to uh, the, query, the query type function. So for example, if we create an execute with the associated value of count, then the JSON that you see there would make its way there. And the same again for positive effect, negative effect. It becomes really as easy as adding an additional function which matches the, the query type name. So from a technical perspective, I could probably end the talk there. We've brought in tweets. We've extracted sentiment. We've extracted time keys. We've extra extracted a location. We've put that and modeled that in a way that we can store in memory for fast access and in a way that we can, we can combine them in order to build up more complex queries. And then we've, we've looked at a way, a very simple way, that we're able to execute ad hoc queries on that and extract the value. But for me, there's another question around this. We've looked at what, where, and when. But there's also the, the question of why. And I'm not referring to why was a tweet sent, or why was that particular sentiment felt. I'm referring to why are we doing this type of analysis anyway? At the start of the talk, I, I spoke about social media um, and analysis of social media as a, a mechanism to uh, help us support the management of chronic disease. And that's a fanta fantastic reason to do this type of thing. But not all of the motivations out there are quite so positive. By a show of hands, would anyone in the audience be brave enough to admit to being involved in some, some sort of surveillance? No. Has anyone in the audience got a Twitter account? Or a LinkedIn account? Or a Facebook account? These online social networks, by their very nature, are surveillance. You monitor people, you monitor colleagues, you use it for exchange of communication. And when we're living in a world where we continually blur the rules around what we do and what we survey and the data that we put out there, it becomes very possible that we could blur the line so much that our privacy could be affected. In March of this year, uh, another ThoughtWorks colleague of mine, Dmitry Kleiner, wrote a blog post which extended Cory Doktorov's analogy of data being like uranium. Like uranium, data is all around us. It's fleeting, it moves around, and uranium, when it's in that way, is perfectly safe. In fact, in some cases, it's a micronutrient. But once you stockpile it, and once you refine it in one place, then it starts to become quite dangerous. As Dimitri says, it becomes kaboom dangerous. <laughs> There's a, a German word, and I'm nervous given my audience pronouncing a German word when I'm not a German speaker but it's Datensparsamkeit. Is that right? Close enough? <laughs> and loosely translated into English, for, for anyone out there who, who doesn't speak German, it means data austerity. If you look at the architecture or, or the, the concepts behind this design today, we're never more granular than a country level. We're never more granular than a minute. We don't even store the tweet text. The only thing we store is the sentiment. And if you go further than that, we never talk about a user ID or a username. I would hope that it would be very, very difficult for any, anybody able to break into such a system to be able to identify an individual. And that's important because it's only when we feel our privacy is respected and we have the opportunity to explore how we feel about things and the security of our own friends and family and people that we trust. It's only then that we can avoid being persecuted. So I would urge any developers here today to consider that in Sparsenkate, 
consider being austere with your data. And if you don't need it, don't collect it. Thank you.